All right, everyone. Welcome back to this week's episode of the podcast. Um, this week, we'll be interviewing Seth Kark, my brother-in-law. He's a filmmaker slash director based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he's worked with uh, Lecrae producing music videos. I know he's worked with several nonprofit organizations, produced several commercials. Uh, feel free to check out his work at SethKark.com. Seth, mm-hmm. thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, man. Excited to do this. Yeah, this is, uh, I guess, so far, Cole and I, we've done a lot of engineering interviews. <laughs> we kind of branched out a little bit with uh, Hannah and physical therapy and Matt and photography. So I'm pretty excited yeah. for this interview. Yeah, yeah man. It's, it's very fun. exciting. So we, we like to start off with kind of your, um, I guess, like what made you... How did you get into your field? Maybe your, your education, your background, um, sure. what, what encouraged you or, you know, if you had any guidance or lack of guidance in high school. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gotcha. Sure, man. Yeah. So, uh, I, I guess I landed in this career, uh, not because I had a childhood dream to be a video director by any means. Um, I guess growing up, I made some just funny, stupid videos with my brother, Matt, who was on a couple weeks ago. Uh, and yeah, we just played around with stuff, but I never thought it would be like an occupation. Mm-hmm. And so upon graduating from high school, I looked into college and initially went, started uh, my college career at Cedarville University uh, for youth ministry and thought that was what I was going to be doing for a little bit. And then about a year in, uh, to my college experience, uh, started thinking about like, what could be a minor that I could add to my course load that, um, would just be like an applicable skill outside of ministry or church setting. Um, Right. And so first, first semester of my freshman or of my sophomore year, uh, I took an audio production course and loved it. It was just like some really cool things that, we were learning uh, and got to, into like a little bit of music production and stuff. Um, really enjoyed it and eventually switched my major from youth ministry to media production. And at that point, I was still thinking like going after audio. Um, so okay, was thinking like radio broadcast or something, maybe sound design for films or something. I didn't know quite yet. Um, but then part of uh, my college uh, courses in the media production program, you also took like some video classes. And so as I started those, I was like, oh, shoot, this is actually really where it's at for me. Um, (laughs) Yeah, uh, just it was a it took what I knew from audio, but added another element to it. Video surprise. Uh, And so (laughs) and so, yeah, just fell in love with it there. Um, Junior year. yeah, right after junior year of college, I got connected with a summer camp in Georgia uh, and went down there for a summer, worked as a videographer doing like weekly highlight videos, but also some fun skit videos and things, um, and eventually returned the following summer as well after my senior year uh, and did more video work there. And um, during that time in Georgia, I uh, started to get connected with some filmmakers in Atlanta, um, about an hour and a half away from that camp. And uh, some of these filmmakers were, were people that I had been starting to like email during during college. Um, okay. Some like other video directors for people like Lecrae and Andy Minio, uh, right. some like Christian hip hop artists that I was into at the time. Um, and we had started some correspondence, found out that they lived in Atlanta. And so while I was in Georgia, felt like I should capitalize on uh making those connections a little stronger so for sure met up with these dudes uh and then found out about one guy in particular named isaac Dietz, who ran at the time uh an artist residency is what he called it called the thunderdome uh and so the thunderdome was a group of young freelance filmmakers um all just sort of figuring out their way in in video production, but also like growing together in like faith and uh, friendship and just like through accountability um, and some really cool things, just like a community oriented thing that uh, oh, that's sweet. I definitely wanted to get involved in. And so after graduation, 
2015 from college. Um, yeah, I started to get connected with these Thunderdomers. Um, and there was like some events and things that I was able to attend that they held for other filmmakers in the area. Uh, and then... About so basically, later, all of your connections, you, you reached out and made the connections yourself. It wasn't like connections through the school or through a counselor or anything like that, was it? Not really, no. Yeah, so I mean, okay. I, had, I had looked up these guys on their websites. Uh, so Isaac Dietz is the guy that runs the Thunderdome that I mentioned. Okay. The other guy was a guy named Kyle Detman, who was at the time um, like the video director at Reach Records which is uh, the label that Lecrae and Andy Minio, some of those artists that I was a big fan of, uh, right. were at. And so through email correspondence with them... Just making cold really, calls. That's basically what was <laughs> up, yeah. Uh, just connected with them and uh, found my way into Atlanta and then moved in uh, to the Thunderdome in 2016. Uh, so that was right after you graduated? It was about six months after. or I guess I graduated May 2015. Uh, okay. Went back... Worked my second summer at the camp and then stayed on as an intern throughout the fall, got connected at the Thunderdome, and then officially moved in uh, January 2016. So, okay, so when you uh, graduated from really Cedarville, clear. was it a Bachelor's of Arts in Broadcasting? or That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I do have a degree. Uh, it hasn't come up in conversation with anyone. <laughs> like, nobody hires filmmakers for their degree they hire you okay. for your portfolio uh, that's gotcha. well, that's good yeah. Ask, yeah. that's good to know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um but yeah yeah so i've been down here uh going into my fifth year really of freelance work um just been a journey moving from just working on set as like a production assistant or setting up lights and stuff to um being able to run the show a little bit more direct some music videos um or like lead out on uh, some big editing projects for documentaries and stuff. Um, yeah, so it's been it's been a journey. It's been really fun. Wow, mm-hmm. how it's cool. I guess just I guess for freelancing, is it ever like how do you uh, I guess prepare your budget for the year, knowing that you don't have like maybe <laughs> a a fixed income coming in? How does that That's facts, man? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't. I guess is okay. a simple answer. Uh, I mean, I have a general idea of about how much I could make in a given year. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's more of a month to month thing than like an annual budget. Also, I'm gotcha. not married. I don't have kids. And so <laughs> I don't have to worry quite as much about like the expenses or lack thereof. Uh, right. Or lack of income like affecting other people. And so... If I get to that point where I'm married and have kids, maybe I'll reconsider and try to try to land like a job with a full time place that has insurance and a steady paycheck. Um, But for now, it's been really cool to just like be able to have the opportunity to just sort of do things at my own pace, take the jobs I want to take and get into some really cool doors that I probably wouldn't be able to say yes to if I if I did have. Uh, the responsibilities of a family at this current time. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, don't tell your sister. <laughs> I can definitely Whoops. see some benefits <laughs> in <laughs> um, the freedom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's nothing like being a bachelor. I, That's I what's up. To that. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. So is, so going or, back, go to ahead, your, Cole. Uh, Going back to your cold calls when you were yeah. just trying to get plugged in, did you do you attach like a resume? Is there, is a resume just a video? You just like link a YouTube channel and say, "Hey, check out what I've done," or or um, did you I guess cite your education in that? No, so I guess it was like senior year of college when I was really doing some of those emails, and it was more a thing of like uh, I reached out to these guys. Um, and referenced like some of their work. I was like, hey, I saw this video that you did for Lecrae. Really awesome stuff. I myself would love to do something similar to what you're doing someday. And more asking their advice, like what are the steps that I could be taking now as like somebody who's about to graduate from college to be able to walk along the same path that you did. And like if, ask them about their journey um, and try to learn from that more so than like promoting my own work because uh, I guess 
I don't know a ton about engineering, uh, but I would assume that like, Jake, definitely correct me if I'm wrong. When you come out of school, uh, you're pretty well prepared with like the basic level of education to be able to like be competent in in an engineering job. Uh, that's debatable. Well, <laughs> debatable. Yeah, it's, like, it's it's like you have the basic knowledge to be a competent engineer. Mm-hmm. But then I feel like your first job actually, or each job that you go to, kind of trains you in the way they want you to be an engineer is I guess how I would describe it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. I think there's, there's still some differences with uh, like film. There's just like a skill gap for Hmm. everyone coming out of college between somebody who just graduated college, who may have been like in the top of their program as far as like making some really killer content. But um there's still years of experience that needs to happen before they're like actually making, um, actually able to direct like higher level projects. Um, okay. And so I guess, yeah, you probably, you, maybe you do have, uh, you have a ladder that you're trying to climb and stuff too, probably. Am I right? We're all uh, climbing ladders. Yeah. Climbing ladders. <laughs> <laughs> um, or slides. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess, so getting back to your initial question was just, um, yeah, so I emailed them asking them more about their experience and how I can learn from that to help myself get to, to the spot where they are rather than like promoting myself because I know that as a college student, a student film is just not going to be impressive to somebody right. who's been in the industry for six, seven years, however long they were directing okay. um, content at that point. That's um, a slick move. That's yeah, I think that's cool. You're really buttering them up. Yeah, you know, and hey, I'm here now, so <laughs> well, I guess it works. Look at me now. Uh-huh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, at, at the Thunderdome, was it like, did they have, I guess, weekly, um, like, jobs for you to do as a part of that? Did they have connections that always brought in new work, or were you still... In the, in the Thunderdome, but kind of freelancing, trying to build up build up your own clientele. Uh, a bit of both. So okay, I found quickly that freelancing uh, was so much about just who you know, rather than like the work that you're capable of. And so it's not that the Thunderdome had like a client base that like was ready to just like give you work. Um, I was from the start, just like trying to find my own clients and things. Um, But filmmaking is, is very much a team effort. And so um, if I have a roommate that gets hired to direct uh, some random commercial or promo, um, they might need a hand on set. Uh, Okay. And so they hire me to go and like help them with the lights uh, or run audio or something. And in that, I get some experience on set, I get to meet some people, and then your network just continues to expand. And so, um, so yeah, uh, there was a bit of like just looking for clients, but there was also um, just the opportunity to be in a network that was already functioning in the industry of filmmaking. And so I got to sort of like tag along and we all sort of were running together and helping each other out. In, I was going to say, it, it sounds... Process very much like a uh, a mutually beneficial uh, group or experience because if everyone's in there and you have five guys and everybody's getting their own work and you're all hiring each other to work on mm-hmm. each other's projects, yeah. you're really getting all around experience and really building your network pretty quickly coming out of school. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's that on. Okay. It's a symbiotic well, relationship. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. For sure. I guess one of the questions like I have about like, cause I've, I've seen a lot of your, your content from earlier, earlier and then progressing up your career. And like, you can definitely tell that there's improvement all the way through, but I like, how do you learn? I guess what aspects do you learn that are you're like, Oh, this will make the video or this will make the promo so much better than how I would have done it before. Um, that's is it tough. just like uh, nicks and little nicks and tricks, lighting? Is yeah, it... lighting is a huge thing that uh, just more time, 
practicing, you start to develop a better eye for it. Um, I mean, in the same way that like a kid who is painting in art class uh, in ninth grade who loves painting, I don't know, this is just a random example, uh, starts painting and their first painting is just garbage. Uh, <laughs> as, they, as they continue to paint and just practice that discipline, they're going to become better uh, by finding their technique, uh, by being able to like connect uh, just like reality with what's going on to the canvas um, or how colors mix. I don't know. I don't paint, um, but but yeah, <laughs> I think it's it's just a, it's just a it's just a discipline and a a skill that just continues to be refined and polished uh, as you do it more. Okay. So that brings up a, another question. What, as you progress through your career, presumably you also had more capital to, to buy stuff. Or, well, I guess, it, do you own your own equipment or do you, do they provide uh, that you just direct and tell people what to do? Um, so I do own a decent amount of gear, or enough gear to be able to like do a job on my own. Um, but there's so many different types of cameras at so many different, production levels uh that like i yeah sometimes i'll use my gear and sometimes i'll rent something that's like a lot higher end something that's more expensive than what i own um in order to get a better image quality uh for mm -hmm. the client or something like that so it varies uh and that's pretty consistent throughout most freelance filmmakers is they might have some gear that they can accomplish a job on if they need to um but for the most part, uh, you also have some connections with other better cameras, better lighting, better sound, um, other people that can help you do the job uh, to a higher level than what you could do individually. Okay, and I guess and so you've kind of had access through throughout your career. You've had access to the higher end stuff, just just renting it or or through friends and stuff. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, more or less. Uh, and also, I mean, there's still there's still a long way for me to go. Uh, There's and, always the higher end. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've been able to shoot on some like really expensive cameras, but that's not like the normal for me at this point by any means. Uh, it's um, few and far between that I get to shoot on like something. I mean, there's like a camera, the Ari Alexa mini that runs for like $60,000 just for the, the body of the camera. I've shot on that like a couple times, but it's like, that's insane to try to like wow. just wow, own wow, wow. that piece of equipment <laughs> yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's much more effective to just like rent that out if, if you need it for a single job. I guess, w would you be able to tell us about um, like your process, like a client, you know, Lecrae comes up to you and was like, does <laughs> he know, tell you? Yeah. You know, and you know Text somebody you or whatever. Uh -huh. <laughs> does he mean does Craig. he lay, lay out a vision for you, or does like does he give you some points and then let you fill in the gaps, or does he kind of, uh, I guess, paint a picture for you and then you give yeah. him a product and go back and forth? Um, so it varies from job to job. I guess for the sake of picking one thing, uh, we'll talk. We I can explain kind of like the music video process that I've done a few times. Um, and also, I haven't, I haven't directed a music video for Lecrae. Um, I've done a little bit of other stuff for him, uh, some editing and some filming for promo type content. Um, but, but yeah, I guess the process of getting a music video to happen, um, an artist might approach me with a song uh, saying like, hey, we want, we want a video for this thing. Um, and if it's coming from like a label uh, rather than the artist directly, uh, right. there might be multiple filmmakers trying to write ideas for the same video. Um, oh, so it's like a competition. It can be, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, I've, I guess the, the process of writing your idea is called writing a treatment. And so I've written a number of treatments for uh, some music videos for like, artist under the same label as uh lecrae um a few times haven't gotten picked yet uh <laughs> but hopefully we'll see someday um uh but
but yeah, so that process uh, is like they just sort of give you a song and possibly a rough budget. They're like, okay, we have this song and you have 1500 2000 6000 whatever it might be, dollars to, to accomplish a music video for this song. Um, send us your ideas. And so you just listen to the song a bunch, uh, try to pull out some themes, some cool ideas. You might put together in, your, in the music video treatment just like assemble a bunch of reference images that have kind of the color and the tone um, that you would want to put into this into the video that you want to make. Um, and then like a story idea of like, over the course of the video, Lecrae goes to Subway and gets a sandwich and then throws it on the ground because he's mad and I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's and some, so you that's just like outline right there. That's what's up. Yeah, I'm going to go shoot that next week. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> you do. You just give them an idea, um, and then the artist will look through all the ideas submitted uh, and pick one that they like the most. Um, and from there, uh, you start getting into more of production setting. So once you have your budget locked in, you can start making some hires, of talking to your friends and seeing who's available to help you out on set, uh, booking different gear rental. Um, if you have to buy certain props, uh, get those arranged figure out your locations, just a bunch of producing elements that have to come together before you can even like start to film. Um, and then, so I was going to say, how long does that process or how long would a music video process take? Uh, again, that's, it's project to project. Um, okay. Sometimes they want like a really quick turnaround thing um, where you might have like four or five days to, to write, shoot, edit everything. Um, other times there's more time uh, to just like sit with the, the song, write a treatment. Um, you might have more time to pull things together. Um, it just really depends on the song and, and what your idea is and the budget and stuff. So, yeah. So this, is, this is kind of a irrelevant question, but I'm going to ask it because it's interesting to me. Do Let's you go. get to hear the songs before they're released? You know, if somebody's dropping a music video like mm -hmm. with an album, you, yeah. you're like, on the, oh, that's that's the good stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, so it's been fun to be, I'm not going to lie, it's been fun to be on the inside a couple times. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the dream. Hearing, hearing some dope, really dope music. Um, yeah, yeah. I, huh. Is the, is the, I guess this is another question for filmmaking. Is there like a type of film... I guess, is there, yeah, a different category for filmmaking? Like, all right, there's music videos and there's documentaries and then there's something else. Do you have a favorite or is there is there a difference to the process going in? Um, is one um, require more creativity? Because I feel like, I guess I could see a music video trying to require more creativity where a documentary, I feel like, would kind of be more uniform, free free flowing thought almost yeah that's pretty that's pretty accurate uh yeah i guess music videos tend to exhibit a little bit more creative freedom at least in the ones that i've done than like a documentary has i think the creativity that comes in a documentary is a little bit more in like the edit and so okay. if you spend a week filming a bunch of different events downtown atlanta of i guess the project I did recently was for the Atlanta Dream Center, which does like some poverty restoration, uh, okay. people off the streets and stuff. So had a couple times where I was just filming stuff uh, in the city uh, with some of their outreach programs and then just getting a bunch of other shots around the city um, of buildings and random stuff uh, to cut into the video as well. The creativity then becomes like, how do I take all this footage that I've just been gathering and construct it into a narrative that makes sense. Um, there can be documentaries that are a lot more uh, outlined from the start of like, yeah, we're tracking a musician and their rise to fame. Um, I know like Taylor Swift had like a documentary come out within the past couple of years about some of her career path. And so when they're filming that it's it's much more documented of like where this is going um type of thing but but yeah music videos can definitely put you in a sphere where um 
you're having to think about things a little bit more creatively with, with how you're lighting things and how you're creating a character um, and telling a story through the song. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you do you get much into animation? like, um, Or do you, I guess, mostly focus with uh, live physical subjects rather than like computer rendering, uh, videography uh, or filmmaking? Yeah, I've, I've never done anything crazy animated. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of a world of its own. It's different. It's different softwares. It's different training. Um, even though it's in the same vein, um, yeah. So I wouldn't turn down a gig to to do like an animated thing if I was directing. I know that I wouldn't have the skill set to be able to okay. accomplish that myself. It would. I could probably like advise someone on how to tell the story and get it to where we all wanted it to be. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a different skill set. Yeah, mm-hmm. for the most part. Do you think? Um, I know you said that a lot of the the jobs you've gotten and stuff have been based on prior work and in connections. But do you think that the schooling you got helped you with your current career or or what you're currently doing, or was it more just part of the journey? Um. I've said I've said before uh, to people that have asked that question, like I think I think schooling was necessary for me to get to where I'm at because I didn't realize that I enjoyed film until I got to college, um, and so college was kind of a necessary like pivot point for me to to really open up that understanding and like see the potential of where it could go. Um, I think there are a bunch of people in high school who are like man, I just want to make videos. I think it'd be really fun to make videos. And that's the career path that I want to take. And I don't think that they need college per se. I think that somebody who has that vision and and goal coming out of high school is better off in a lot of circumstances, uh, just like trying to make those connections and doing work for free and just trying to make some really killer stuff put up on a website and and show it to people and hopefully get some more work. Um, College can be beneficial. Uh, I definitely learned a good bit through my program. Um, But to someone who's like coming out of high school and wants to know if they should do college to study and then go into filmmaking as a career or just like try to hop right into a career of it, uh, I think the biggest factor for me to ask them about is more of just like college debt. Like, are you going to go to school and come out with like 150 grand in debt? Cause if you are, don't, don't go to school. Just make some really good stuff. Don't do it. Um, If you can go to school and get a degree and have really low amount of debt or even do it for free and like work your way through it, like work summer jobs and pay your way through as you go. Sure. Degree could be great. Um, but I, I also know a number of people who are doing really well in the industry who never had any sort of schooling. Yeah, so, Seth, yeah, you're talking to two people who wish they didn't have to go to school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wished, regret, you know. <laughs> that's, it that's, is what it is. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. Yeah. Climbing ladder, ladders or slides. <laughs> yeah, shoes and ladders, man. Let's go. Uh-huh. I, I have a question about um, filming rights. Because, like, all right, I obviously watch too many movies and have seen <laughs> too much stuff. But, you know, you get to the end and they're, they'll thank the city of Atlanta. They'll thank, you know, um, what's <laughs> right. a, another common city they film in. And, it, like, I guess, is that only, like, all right, for a Hollywood movie that's obviously big budget, big big production they're bringing in a bunch of people they're filming in this location they're gonna have to shut down streets and they're wanting to give i guess credit to the city of atlanta but like when you're filming everyday stuff and you're filming in different locations you, you don't have to give credit to no no okay all right Mm-mm. good no yeah there have been times where i'll just get random i mean that project that i was talking about a little bit ago with the atlanta dream center i was filming downtown for a couple days just going in and out and getting different stuff. Um, You don't have to get the mayor to sign off on your video. Uh, Be like, yep, 
thanks for thanks for acknowledging us as a city. Um, <laughs> well, I, I didn't know if you had to get like some sort of permit or well, something. So if you that's, wanted to that is my downtown. next comment. Is that okay. uh, most of the stuff that I'm shooting at this point is uh, kind of I guess the term would be run and gun or guerrilla, where it's just like <laughs> where it's just like you you show up, you get the you get the clips you need, and then you leave before security talks to you. Uh, there have <laughs> I guess technically, technically speaking, if you're in like a public space uh, in a park or like a space that's visible from the street, you're you're allowed to film there. Like that's yeah, you shouldn't be kicked out. Uh, okay. There have been times though that even with that, you get police that come up to you or security guards and like, hey, you got a permit? And you just got to say, like, respectfully, like, nope. And they're like, okay, well, we need you to leave. Like, all right, well, can't argue with that, I guess. Like, <laughs> I mean, I could well, argue, I but I'm try. not gonna. <laughs> right. Um, it's it's a little annoying, but, um, yeah. Uh, you don't need to give permission. You should get a permit if you're trying to do something big budget that requires a decent level of production. Um, but a lot of times you can just sort of wing it and get away with it um yeah okay um, a, a, a similar question to that is what what happens once your video is produced so if you're you produce a music video documentary whatever who who owns that like if you're an independent contractor do you own any rights to that uh to that movie or or that film or is it solely whoever uh paid you to produce it that owns it um I guess I think some some of the, like the legal stuff that comes with comes in that area actually happens in like the larger scale productions uh, where you start to get more residual income um, and like different breakdowns for like I don't know a blockbuster Hollywood movie if it does really well Leonardo DiCaprio is going to get paid more than just his time on set. Um, that type of thing is not happening on my scale. Uh, so ownership and stuff, I guess if I make a product for a client, I say, I tell them like, yeah, you can use this however you'd like. Um, I still ask like, am I able to put this on my website um, as just a reference and be able to like show and put my name on it somewhere, possibly in the YouTube description or whatever. Um, just, yeah, to be able to have proof of my work in it um but but yeah legal stuff of like who's what whose money or no how much money should get like split to x person and this person and this person who all had hands in the pot for making a certain video that type of stuff doesn't happen until you're dealing with like much bigger budgets than than stuff that i'm working with at this point okay i i, I have another question about um like after after you film every get all your film, what software are you using using to edit and splice all this together? Uh, Adobe has a bunch of really great softwares in their package that um, that I've been doing stuff okay. like that for for a while. Adobe Premiere Pro is the program that I use for Ooh. everything at this point. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the most common software uh, as well. There's a couple others that. Some people will use DaVinci Resolve as one that is particularly good for color grading. So like after, you've, after your video is done, done, uh, people will go in and like adjust the saturation and uh, contrast and things to, to fine tune it in, in color grading uh, is that process. And so there's some certain softwares that other people might prefer for stuff like that over Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, but I've gotten really comfortable in in that um program and so i use that for everything okay now cool. so does that like does it i guess what i'm trying to imagine and editing to that does that have all your like your your still image shots all together or all your image shots in a line and then the audio below that like mm -hmm. yeah pretty okay. much yeah so i mean it breaks it down track by track so it's yeah it's just like a bunch of horizontal layers on top of each other uh, of different layers of video that you can start and stop whenever you want and when you stop one clip 
have the other one move to right start and everything and then yeah in a separate layer of horizontal layers there's all the audio stuff that you manipulate as well mm -hmm. what okay what computer do you do you have a ginormous computer to to render all this stuff and, and put it together uh, uh not super big i work on a macbook pro uh for pretty much everything um if i was doing something a lot more uh computer intensive that had a lot more like graphics or something that required a higher level of computer processing i might consider purchasing something uh, that has has more rendering power and uh, different things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the MacBook Pro, I have like a 2017 15 inch MacBook Pro that has like 16 gigs of RAM and I don't know what kind of other specs are on it off the top of my head. But yeah, uh, nothing, nothing crazy, crazy. Yeah, that's, that's cool that so it, it seems like your, your equipment it is is accessible it's not like you've had to spend thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on stuff right to into into filmmaking which i think is really cool mm -hmm. yeah uh there's there's something that you can always purchase uh at a, and continue to just like build build your equipment base over time and also i mean with the rise in social media and instagram and tiktok and everything like <laughs> like people tiktok tiktok uh people don't need to have like the crazy expensive equipment to make content that's going to be watched these days either uh there's plenty of people who have millions of views on videos that they make that they shoot with their iphone uh yeah. and so i mean i can i might be able to get a better image with the camera that i own uh but is a better image really going to help your client get more views or is it something else entirely like i'm i'm glad to have the equipment that i do um but i think that can also be a hold up uh, for young filmmakers to be like oh i just need a better camera or i just need to purchase this next piece of equipment um when in reality it's like no just make something make the best thing you can with what you have right now um, and just continue to get experience with lower end gear. And if you really can polish a turd with, with the stuff that <laughs> the, the bad gear, by the time you start working with uh, the good stuff, you're going to be able to make some really great content. Uh, having diamonds. So, that's right. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yep. That's right. <laughs> that's cool. Wow. Yep. I guess I also, I wanted to know, like, when you, like, when you go to the movies, do you, are you watching something or like, oh, this is, this is not even good. This is, like, do you, do you, do you feel the need to critique everything now that you're in the business and you're like, oh, well, this could have been done a little better or this, I, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's things that I can, that I feel like I might be able to have an eye to critique more, but there's okay. also a lot of elements that I can appreciate more as well of like, okay. oh wow that was a really impressive uh cut like the timing of that edit was perfect for the emotion that they were trying to communicate and different things like that that like an average viewer might be like i didn't even realize that they made that cut uh i was just like watching the characters talk and so i might see things that i critique and be like well yeah that was just bad filmmaking uh, in my opinion but there's also plenty of things that i can just like see and appreciate on a whole nother level because i've been able to like work and and struggle to like work out an edit and be like man this just isn't feeling how i want it to feel and so to see somebody else accomplish um an edit or shoot an image that just like captures the tone that i know they were going for is like okay awesome good on you like well done so it's a bit of a mix. Props. Yeah. Props. <laughs> Respect. Yep. Well, that's what I've been, I've been watching a lot of, um, I don't know, some, how I got on the, you know, YouTube pops up in my feed and um, Peter McKinnon. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. heard of him. I have. He, yep. I, he does these, um, oh, what, reactions to 
commercials and he did a review okay. on some one shot filmmaking mm-hmm. and some of those are just insane to watch oh, how yeah. how long the one shot sequence was yeah. and like the almost the choreography that took mm-hmm. place was i don't know i was yeah. very impressed with <laughs> yeah for real have you guys seen 1917 it came out last year yes heard of it? yeah i did it's a war movie uh cole have you seen it or heard of it i haven't okay incredible incredible war movie it's just like the big the big market value thing for it was like it's all one long continuous shot throughout the entire movie um and in reality they filmed a bunch of different shots and then were able to like edit them in a way that made it seem seamless and look like one shot but just like the ability to make it make it all seem that seamless and smooth is like really impressive uh having tried to do uh some one shot type <laughs> things gonna, myself uh, and be like yeah i missed that i missed that one for sure <laughs> uh but yeah yeah i'm gonna have to go back and rewatch it now because i i was definitely i remember there's like Obviously, in that movie, he's running a lot. <laughs> There's a, a right. lot of, uh-huh. like, you uh-huh. can tell it's like a one shot running scene, but I'm going to have uh-huh. to go back and rewatch it now to see if I can, I guess, pick up on that. L- like, look where the edits are or try to find them? Or... Did you notice I, that it was only one shot? I, I guess I. I, I, there's one scene in my mind where he's he's running across the battlefield and like mm-hmm. I can I guess in when I was watching it I was like oh they did that in one shot but I wasn't really thinking about the whole movie as being a one shot oh, yeah. film. Oh yeah, it's it's an incredible piece that I mean I just have a bunch of respect for it. The guy who shot it uh, is one of my favorite directors of photography um, who's done some other incredible incredible movies. Um, yeah, check it out for sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I have the inside scoop before I watch it. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's right. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I have another question. Like, cause we, so we interviewed Matthew, you know, a couple of weeks back, and he basically just, he's grown his photography business and remains in photography. Do you, do you ever mix over between, like, just – photos and video or do you strictly try to do video filmmaking work i have i've just done video um okay yeah that's been my only thing i guess recently i have done a little bit of like just audio work um mixing different podcasts and stuff that some friends of mine have recorded um but yeah i've I've never done any sort of like paid photography work um okay it's been like pretty much one lane uh, of video and filmmaking. Yep. And, and where do you see, like, are you kind of living your dream right now? Is this, is this kind of the niche you want to be part of, or are you like going straight to the top? You want to be shooting the next 1917 film? Next Star Wars. Star Wars. Nah, that's not my lane. Um, (laughs) Well, even just like Hollywood movie, like that's not, that's not where I see myself going. Okay, um, okay. I think, I think, uh, yeah, there's an element of where I'm at right now. That's like, this is really cool. I enjoy where I'm at. I'm getting to do some really cool things with some great people. Um, some, some stuff that's like getting into doors with music artists that I never thought I might be able to, uh, but also like opportunities to, to make stuff for, um, homeless outreach organizations and like do some humanitarian type work that like feels a lot more significant and purposeful. Um, and so I think down the road, five years from now, um, if I was doing pretty pretty similar work to what I'm doing right now, I wouldn't be disappointed. Uh, I think I would hope to continue to just like refine my craft and, and make better work uh, within this same setting. Um, but yeah, I, I've enjoyed a lot of the types of jobs that i've been able to get recently for sure that's what really last cool. last year at this time um we were all doing the uh family vacation and seth oh yeah happened to not be there that's and, right uh, i believe I you were, you, yeah you were yep. uh, you were filming in africa at that time correct that is correct yep what what organization was that for 
Uh, it was an organization called Heart for Africa. Um, yeah, they have uh, one main site in a small country in South Africa called Eswatini. Um, and it's like a, a children's home uh, where they rescued over 250, I believe, uh, orphans who have just been like abandoned on the side of the road. Uh, oh, Eswatini yeah. itself is a country that has like one of the highest AIDS rates in the world uh, and a lot of disease, a lot of poverty, a lot of starvation. Um, and this uh, organization, Christian organization, has uh, started to plant roots. I guess they've been there for a little over, I guess about 11 years now. Um, and just like rescuing children, taking them in, building this uh, children's home. Um, educating them as they've gotten older. Uh, they've also like created a bunch of uh, self-sufficient farming efforts. Um, they have like aquaponics and different things in a greenhouse that they've built. They employ like 300 plus people from the community. Um, wow. And so like they're helping fight poverty in that way as well uh, through just like giving people around them uh, more consistent work so they can supply for their families and stuff and so it's a it was a really cool opportunity to just like go and and see some of the things that are happening in a culture completely separate from from stuff here in the states um right but also just like really cool to experience and see the joy and uh transformation that's happening through um through gospel-centered work that they're doing through through loving people well um yeah heart for africa Help how did you get connected with them or how did they find you maybe? Oh man, that's a fun story. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it was July, July, 2019 was the trip. Uh, around April of 2019, April or May, I was filming behind the scenes for a conference for a band. North point worship is, um, a band that I got hired to just film some random stuff with um, as they were like getting set up for the concert uh, and different things. And one of the guys on the band, uh, his name is Seth Condry. He was telling me, he's like, oh man, I'm going to Africa in like two months. And they're this organization that rescues like babies off the side of the street and has like developed this crazy thing. Everything that I just told you guys, he told mm -hmm. me. He's like, wouldn't it be so cool to like make a documentary about these people and like this organization? I was like, dude, that sounds incredible. Unfortunately, that's two months away and a lot of money. <laughs> and I don't know how I would make that happen. Uh, and so I was like, thanks for thanks for looking out, bro. But I don't think I can swing it. Hit me up on the next trip, though, if you have a little bit more notice and maybe I can raise funds. Yeah, that was another thing was like this trip was it wasn't like a thing that was paid for by heart for Africa. Um, okay. I would have had to raise my own funds and support. Um, and so at that point in May, uh, I met this dude for the first time. He tells me about it. I say, no, we leave. I never really expected to like see or hear from him again. Um, about a month later, uh, I about a month later, I'm at a job in Dallas, Texas, uh, for some completely different client. Um, and we finished that job. I'm back at the airport, heading back to Atlanta. And who do I see? Seth Condry in the terminal with his family. I'm like, no way. What are the chances that we meet up? Where are you going, bro? Back to Atlanta. Oh, that's crazy. We're on the same flight. Oh, crazy. <laughs> and so we end up sitting one seat apart from each other on this airline, on this flight. Like, that's, I mean, assigned seating and stuff. Wow. Like, what are the chances of this? Uh, it's not chances. Um, I mean, I believe that it was, like, God-ordained, like, intervention yeah. for, for him to just, like, put us back in that setting. Um, and so both of us were like, well, seems like you need to come to Africa. And so <laughs> uh, the next week or so, I, like, prayed about it, talked with some friends and family <laughs> about things. Um, and decided yeah i need to make this happen um we gotta we gotta do this and so i started to raise funds uh and at the time i needed 
about like $4,500 to raise in like a month's time uh, to get on a plane and go. And within a week, I had all of it. It was crazy. Just like between like my church family and uh, my family family uh, and and some (laughs) other people that just all contributed and were able to make it happen. Um, It was wild. Yeah. And so I'm still connected with them. Uh, Was hoping to make another return trip this year. But COVID, COVID, you know, mm-hmm. yep, yeah. The so. dreaded COVID. The dreaded COVID. We'll see. Hopefully, uh, do it again soon. I was hoping COVID would only make it in like our first couple podcasts, but it's still. In full <laughs> <swing>. Oh man, <laughs> you got a few <laughs> more yet where it's gonna come, man. I bet. Oof. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yep. Wow. Well, yep. Hey, well, Seth, I I guess the one the question we kind of always kind of ask at the end is. Looking back over your career, where you're at now, um, even back in high school when you were looking for colleges, um, what do you wish you know someone told you along the way or at multiple points in this path um, that if you knew this, it would have made it would have made life so much easier, it would have made your career easier, um, anything like that. Um, I think I think just like advice I would give to uh, 17 year old Seth would be like just <laughs> to, to like look for ways to continue to learn from people ahead of you um, yeah I think just remain open to uh, the path that that could turn and change in a way that you might not expect um, but just like continue to just be humble and ready to receive uh, criticism and um, just the opportunity to learn from people who are doing the types of things that you want to do um, and and take take jobs that uh, you might not want to take uh, because they might uh, put you in a setting that will allow you to connect with more people. Um, yeah, I think that's not a super fluid answer, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, just make sure to prioritize people more than yourself. Um, is still a, a thing that I think every person on this planet is needs to continue to develop, uh, myself included, for sure. Um, but just what are the ways that you can walk in, in humility and um, just like putting others before yourself? And that's gonna that's gonna get you a long way. Um, no, I think I mean I think that's a great answer. I've um, definitely <laughs> experienced that myself at work where. I've worked with some people who I would say are, you know, um, not the most humble uh, people Mm -hmm. to work with, very prideful. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I've worked with the the opposite. I've worked with people who are very humble, very, you know, want to help. And in return, (laughs) I always want to go help the other person rather than the the person who uh, Mm kind of spited me. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a, a terrific answer and definitely yeah. uh, terrific advice for, I guess, kind of where we're at in our, uh, I guess, culture right now. And, you know, if you watch mm-hmm. the news, you just get sad. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's advice that hopefully spans between uh, between career paths as well. I mean, in yeah. my specific field, filmmaking is yeah so much about who you know. And so if you're able to just develop those network connections and, and make content with, with whatever resources you have available and just be kind in the process, um, that's going to that's gonna get you a lot further than having like the high-end camera that certain people want. Because, I mean, you could have really nice gear, but if you're a jerk, no one's going to hire you anyway. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cole, did you have anything else to add? I don't. I uh... Really appreciate you coming on this week, Seth. It was very interesting to to learn a bit a bit more about how the videos and movies I spend countless hours watching are produced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. Thank you for having me again. And check out 1917, Roger Deakins. Beautiful, beautiful movie. Also, mm-hmm. check out SethKark.com. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there we go. Up and coming. Uh-huh. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Hey, th- thanks for coming on, Seth. Absolutely. Thanks again.